All right. This is going to be our second day of our conference and continuation of what we left off from uh, yesterday. Uh, so as we are continuing to pursue these adversities and overcome these obstacles, you just forge ahead. I guess it's like a microcosm of things in life that we all deal with on a much larger scale. These are um, you know, all things we deal with, um, challenges. And so let's, uh, let's, let's pray and we'll get going for our day two, uh, what was meant to be a three-day <laughs> conference. So um, well, let, let's pray. So Father, we thank you so much for what you do for us and sustaining us, providing us uh, the, the, the pathway through life obstacles and challenges and help us to see your hand in it, help us to continue to uh, press on, holding tightly, more securely to your hand, uh, not less, but more in times of difficulty and challenges and things that press on us emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically. Help us to uh, press on, press forward, strive as you as you tell us to do, as you desire for us to seek that narrow way of life. There's a few that find it and help us to, again, continue on this ongoing seeing and believing, the ongoing partaking of your flesh and drinking of your blood in, in a sense of taking in your word and then also applying that, seeking ways to apply it to our life. Help us to love you with our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves, and all these fulfilling the law of the prophets. And so we ask that you uh, help us now to see more of your word, understanding for the purpose of not to just enlighten us with knowledge, but deepen our understanding so that we can be changed by you and have your conforming righteousness in us come out of us. From your word is our, our foundation, our faith. You're the foundation, we use that word to continue to build upon that foundation. So we thank you so much for your love and for your provision. Be with uh, Sister Vicky's mom. Continue to help her to recover and get better and strengthen her. Help us all in this situation that we have gone through. Uh, the trials help those in the hurricane situation. Um, help my baby right now at home dealing with the stomach getting better. And just continue to help on all of us to, as your sheep and your servants, be hearing intently unto you, seeking you and following you um, more closely. And as we do that, we cling even tighter to the truth that we warp your word, being grateful for what you've given to us and are yet to show us again as you already have shown us and given us so much. Uh, help us to be grateful, rooted in not looking for more, but just being satisfied where we are, but striving always to get closer to you, looking introspectly. So be with us now as our pastor, our teacher, our guide, our shepherd, our coming bridegroom. We ask uh, you just again, be glorified, and you would have the words of my mouth and the taste of my heart be acceptable in your sight. If you are our Lord, our God, our Redeemer, our Savior, Jesus, Yeshua's name, we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, welcome everybody online today. So we're going to continue uh, where we left off on page 7 near the bottom. Um, and as we were uh, recapsing, re uh, recap, recapsing, <laughs> recapping uh, where we were last time, on the issue of looking at how uh, you know people are, who is a Christian, how do you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then who is the bride of Christ, and looking at these different uh, colloquialisms or anecdotes that Christianity has just, unfortunately, they have done a very good job of, of repetitive nature. And it's the old adage of, of repetitive, repetitive things. That, and I think there's a thing out there in social media, they call it the Mandela Effect, when you continue to think about something the wrong way without realizing it's wrong, it becomes what you think is true when it all along was wrong. And that's what happens with Christianity a lot. They continue to repeat and parrot and not check and challenge their understanding, and they continue to just repeat it because it's what people say. I'll give an example also of another thing regarding, um, we talked about the seven letters to the churches, and one of the other problems with Christianity, churchianity is, the last letter written to Laodicea, as we're going to get back into page seven, but just a snippet to recap some of the misunderstandings and misinterpretations, therefore just misapplications to scripture, is they'll go into the scripture in Laodicea and they'll say, well, God says I'd rather you be hot nor cold, but you're lukewarm, so I spew you out of my mouth. And modern Christianity and commentaries will say, hot is when you're on fire for Jesus, and cold is when you don't know Jesus at all. But, but wait a minute, Jesus said he wants you to be hot or cold. So they're both good things. So explain that, preacher man. Explain that denominational guy and gal. Go ahead. I got all that. Go. What you got? They don't. They don't want to deal with that. They, they don't. They just gloss right over that. But Jesus did not say cold was bad. He said, "I'd rather you be hot or cold, but you're lukewarm, 
and yet churchianity commentaries they get uh, 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 they get frozen in time with this whole how can cold and hot be so diametrically opposed and they're both good according to Jesus I'd rather you be hot or cold so was it they don't know what to do with that right they need to the issue of he said I stand at the door and knock to turn into some kind of evangelical issue of Jesus not going to deal with your heart it, it, no that's not what's going on there so again they have changed everything back to front to fit a narrative. The door is the same door mentioned in Philadelphia. The open door is the same door mentioned in Revelation 4. The door that's opened up is the same door referen referencing between there, Laodicea. It's, it's a Dyknon door, the door of the second door to the marriage feast. That's right, you heard me correctly. There's a plural marriage feast. In Matthew 22, it tells you that. There's a singular and plural. I didn't write the book. And also in, in Luke chapter 8 and verse 12, it tells you again that this is, you know, an Aristotle the I, I mean, it's just all there. But unfortunately, in English, you miss the interpretations, and then the laziness sets in, and the arguments about King James only is, and all you're doing is serving the, de the intent of the devil. And we talked about before the rapacious wolves, the burdensome issues of people influenced by demons, possessed by demons. All they're trying to do is take down the mature ones. So don't, 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 don't flatter yourself when you go, well, I'm attacked by demons today. No, not, not really. They, they could care less about the average person in Christ. They care about the folks who are maturing in Christ because they're the only ones who have an opportunity to have inheritance in the heavens. They, they don't flatter yourself by people, oh my gosh, I'm attacked by demonic warfare today. And what happened? I had a flat tire. So? So what? Oh, why well, deal with the hurricane flood? People died in the hurricane, right? There's one guy right about night four, sign collapsed on him in Tampa. Holy moly. Right? Fluke things happen all the time. I had my eardrum punctured. Fluke thing, right? Fluke things happen all the time to people that end their life, hurt, maim them. Right? And we all, and then we take the most littlest thing. I think I broke today, and all of a sudden I scratched the leather of my car. I'm being attacked by demons today. Really? That, that, that's what you call that? Oh my gosh. So people just, again, talked about it yesterday. They embellish because we are a needy people. We are a selfish people. That's who we are as human beings. And so we begin to, to embellish. This goes back to our frame of thought of the bride of Christ. People want to embellish also that we're all Jesus' bride. We just are because that's what people have said and repeated, and we got it in our brain cells. It's ingrained, it's ingrained in our head. And yet we saw in Ephesians chapter 5, we went through the verses 25 and onward. And don't forget the, the, the errancy and the error and the lacking of interpretation of the proper language. I took my glasses off here, my apology. Of, of the actual book of, of Ephesians. In chapter 5, going back to that, that last verse, 32, I didn't point out to you, don't forget that in the King James, chapter 5, verse 32 of Ephesians, it just says, and I speak a great mystery concerning Christ in the church. That's what it says in, the, in English. What's wrong with that, you say? There's a lot wrong with that. Because he says, into Christ and into the church. I, I didn't write it, but don't lie to me and then tell me in English it means concerning Christ and the church. You just totally... I think I read somewhere in the book of Revelation not supposed to add or take away. I think I read that somewhere. Yeah. And what happens when you when you take away from the book, he takes away your right to the tree of life and your access to the Holy City. You lose a blessing and benefit. But if you add, then you actually get plagues added unto you. Well, that, that sounds kind of interesting. Adding causes a more heavier consequence. Taking away causes not a negative consequence, but it causes a lack or a a, a, a demotion, if you will, or a exclusion, a disqualification of benefits and blessings, access to the holy city and the tree of life. So, when you're taking away from God's word, tell me how you're not doing that when you are taking the original language of Old Semitic Hebrew or the Koine Greek and you're substituting English words in there and then you're repeating that to your, to your congregation, to your sheep, to your fellow servants, to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and telling them that's what God's saying. How are you not taking away from God's word? When you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 15, and you want to quote the most, the most sensationalism of all time verses being quoted about people looking forward to Jesus coming on taking us away, because I can't wait to 1 Thessalonians 4 15 happens. When well, coming, the coming of the Lord, you no, know, the word is perusia. The word means presence. So you're misleading people, whether you know it ignorantly or whether you know it uh, knowingly. I don't know. I can't speak to your heart and mind. I just know that if you're a student, you've got a little bit of a hall pass. If you're a teacher, there's no excuse. Sorry. Jesus said, um, there's no hall pass for you. That's why James said, be careful if you're a teacher. Well, I didn't know. It doesn't matter if you didn't know. You're supposed to have a, a reverence of, of, of value and of integrity of the language of God's word. 
and you darn well know he didn't speak it in English. You darn well know it wasn't written in English. So why are you holding to the English as the way in which you're going to study and then for export it, expound it to your people and say that's what the Word of God says? You know that's not true. You know that's not true. If you don't know that, you should know that if you're a teacher. And God says, no excuses. The student gets some latitude. The teacher gets none. Zero. What if they don't know? They should know. That's pretty scary. Right? So when you're in First Thessalonians 4.15 and you're preaching as some kind of rapture, you're a liar. You're wrong. It's the perusia of the Lord. It is the presence of the Lord. Don't say coming. It's because well, King James says it. I don't care what it says. It is wrong. Another way in which you continue to trust English and you get misled. So here you go to Ephesians 5.32. It's wrong again. Concerning Christ and the church? No! It's wrong! It's wrong! It says the same thing in the dialogue in English. I get that. This is why I always tell people, I do not trust the English of any translation, whether it's King James or of the Diaglot or the ESV or the NI. I don't care. It's wrong. It's wrong. That's why it's important to understand the original language text and read the actual Greek words and see for yourself. Because guess who? When you're interpreting Old Semitic Hebrew or Koine Greek to English, who's doing that? A human. Can humans be fallible? Are they, are they unfallible? No. Can humans make mistakes honestly or dishonestly? Yes. So why are you trusting what a human is doing? It makes no sense to me. None. Didn't we talk about it yesterday? Study to show yourself approved, right? So rightly dividing, which means you can wrongly divide. Hello, right? Right? This is what it is. Because on theft, it says into. On the left, it says into. Yeah, the, the, the left, yeah. Left says into, right? The secret is this great is. But I speak into the anointed and into the, the ecclesia. So that's what matters, right? What matters is the original text on the left. The right matters not. And by the way, don't forget, underneath the word on the left, the English rendering still doesn't matter. Don't forget, English and any side of the ledger of the Bible, right or left, I don't care. I care about the Greek word. That's what matters. And you better pick up on that, right? So that's why when it says into on the left, you got to pick up on that and go, wait a second, wait a second. And then you go, well, my Bible says, I don't care what your Bible says. What does the original language say? Well, I go by the King James. So you're going by, you're going by a translation of a translation. Uh, right. You know there's 20,000 errors in there, right? What, what? Yeah. Go ahead, though, Mr. King James only. I hope you peek your chest more arrogance and ignorance as you're doing that. You're, all you're doing is telling your signs how ignorant you are. What? It's the best of the English. You've already covered this. I know this. I consent to that. I will give you. It's like saying, all the Shakespeare, all the, all the old playwrights, Shakespeare is the best. So what? We're not talking about playwrights. We're talking about who's the best human, right? Well, the best English version. I don't care. You're such an, it's a, what, a, what a pompous, arrogant attitude to have. Well, since English is the dominant language in the, in the whole world, we should. <laughs> really? Do you hear yourself? How dumb you sound? How arrogant you sound? God, I had one person who tried to tell me that Jesus uh, spoke in English, which is laughable, by the way. <laughs> laughable. And I laughed when, I, when, they, when she said it. And then she says, Jehovah is not laughing right now. I go, oh, trust me. He's not laughing. You're right. He's hysterically laughing because you are completely devoid of common sense. He did not speak in English ever. Okay? Don't be so ignorant. Just say it's a dumb, ignorant thing. It's just so. So how did they change the meaning from about versus into? It's about, okay, you're asking good questions, right? I, I can't speak to why they did that other than the fact that they impose their understanding into the interpretation and they see the word for what it means, but they, they extrapolate something that they believe it to mean. Don't forget, uh, this, was, this was translated after the King James was already written. So you have to make understandable, you have to make sense of this and say, wait a minute, this, even though this is based on older manuscripts, it was translated after the King James. So ergo, there's some influence and some predetermined subconscious nature of wanting to make it become more, I would say, malleable to what you've already accepted as a whole, right? Don't tell me that's not going on. Yes, it is. We all try to fit in and get along. We talked about that yesterday, right? So I can think that's probably the reason why laziness, um, wanting to be more agreeable and harmonious with what's already out there, stuff like that, and just human error, right? That, that, that's why. They just changed it because of those kind of things. But the exact reason is why, I'll never know, because those guys are dead. I can't talk to them and say, hey, why'd you do that? I don't know. So 
but but I can tell you one thing. I could care less the reasons why much as I care about why am I trusting in what English is when I know it wasn't written in English and wasn't spoken in English, regardless of how that is interpreted or how it is written. Why, did, why should that be my focal point of the conversation? Since when is that an issue? Why is that an issue? That's like saying, I say Jesus, j -j -j Jesus. You say it, Jesus. It doesn't matter. His name is Yeshua in the real language, moron. So what's it matter how you pronounce the J with a hard J or a soft J? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, it, you see what I'm saying? How dumb is that that we get so involved in conversations about the English language when in fact it's the original language that matters? So it's Yeshua. That, that's his real name, not Jesus. We say that in English, which is fine, but don't get there and tell me that's how they called him back in the day because they did. They never said uh, Jesus. They didn't say that. They said Yeshua. That's what they said. That, that's how they spoke. They didn't. There's no ja. There's no none of that. So, so it, it's, it's kind of interesting how we compartmentalize and we, 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 we are kind of real prideful and arrogant. This goes back to the Bride of Christ, uh, page seven, that we begin to just generalize scriptures and just begin to just, you know, give in to the majority of thought. And if you, there's the old Hitlerism, they'll, they'll, I won't forget this, I did a paper on Hitler when I was in high school, I mentioned this to people before, but I remember him saying, you, you tell a lie often enough and long enough and loud enough, eventually people start believing it. And he also mentioned, Hitler mentioned, I did a paper when I was in high school, he also mentioned that you give me uh, the, the education system for the child from the age of two to five, I will dictate the ideas and the thought of the next generation. Do you think Hitler's stupid? No. He's a brilliant man who's evil. He knew exactly how to control the narrative of the mindset. You get them while they're young. And that's why Christianity has lied to us for a very long time. They got us while we're young. You go, what does that have to do with anything when we're young? Oh, I don't know. The fact that Noah's Ark tells you that you think there's two by two on the ark when actually Genesis 7 tells you opposite. Hello. It tells you opposite. If you don't know that, check it out. Genesis 7, two by two of the unclean, seven by seven of the clean. It's pretty, the very first three verses of chapter 7. Read it. But then all of a sudden, people go, if you ask the average person, what were you told as a kid? Two by two. Show me one picture that shows seven by seven. None. None exists. None. Not one church has a mural on the wall where they have the right, correct uh, painting. Not one. Not one kid's book has the right image. Not one. Not, I've never seen, if you have one, please show it to me. Please, share with me the, text it to me, email it to me. I'd love to read the author and the publisher of said book. I haven't seen one yet. So think about that. How much does mankind have to show you that they generalize and don't care about the details of what God says? How else do you explain that? How, how, explain it to me. If, they, if it's not not caring, then why is it, is it willful lying? I don't think it's that. I think it's just they don't care. They, they just generalize. Men are prone to do this. Oh, by the way, look at the Red Sea passage. Look at that. Go into a, to a Rose Publishing, whatever. I've mentioned this many times before. Look into them. You'll find three-fourths of them show the arrow going around the Red Sea, which is infuriating. And, very, and then the ones that do show going through the Red Sea, they just clip the top of it. They don't show them going through the heart of the Red Sea. Like, are you serious right now? Like, are you kidding me? This is the people that interpreted the English language. You're supposed to trust that. These are the same idiots who show you not the right animals on the ark and the right number, and they show you a three-fourths of them do not show them crossing the Red Sea, and you're trusting these people. How do you not know they're out to lunch? How do you not? How much is God going to show you before you start realizing, oh, man, he's a liar. God is the only truth. I do. Right? I mean, come on. It's so hard. It's not hard. It's not hard. Open your mind to the truth, right? So how does it change the meaning of the verse? That we're using the words into and into called out ones? Because it changes the meaning of the verse because now when so instead of saying the great mystery is speaking concerning Christ and the church, because now it makes it sound like the mystery is Christ establishing his church. That's what it makes it sound like. That's what church entity says. The mystery is Christ establishing the one new man in Christ, which is the church. That's what they say. That's not what it's saying, though. The mystery is into Christ and into the church. Great segue. Because don't forget, you can believe in Jesus and be saved by His grace through faith with blood applying to your life. But then when you put your faith in action behind living out that belief in Him, now you're into Jesus. You're living in, you're believing into Jesus. You go, what? Yes. Yet we know this. It's on the Great Your Ghost Cycle chart. You can see this from people in the Old Testament, in the book of John, for example, not Old Testament, the, the book of John. The Jewish people followed Jesus. They believed in him. He said many people believed in him in the signs of that day, his first Passover. But he knew in their hearts to not reveal it, not entrust himself to them. 
than the apostles believed in until they were watching him after the wedding of Canaan. They said, and then it says after that, then they believed into him. <laughs> they already believed in him as the Messiah. They were following him already. And then the wedding of Canaan happened, and they go, oh, wow, holy moly, he just turned water to wine. Then it says, then they believed into him, meaning they believed him as the Messiah, but now they're like, dude, this is legit. That, that, it just kind of confirmed what they already knew, and it made them be put more faith into the actions of trusting him as the Messiah. So don't, don't lie to yourself when church Annie goes, in, into, what's the difference? Okay, sure. Okay, then, okay. then, then you, you go to, you, you can walk in the airport, and you can walk into uh, the plane, but tell you what, I'll go into the plane, and I'll catch my flight. You can be in the airport, and you'll miss your flight, because you're not into the, not, you didn't walk into the plane. Just so. So that, that's fine, though. No. You can have fun with that, but I'm going to go to the plane. So the, the reality is that into represents a different mentality. And the mentality is that, okay, this is the, this is the deal, that you can believe in Jesus, but you believe into Jesus when your faith's in action. So when he says into Christ, he's referring to people that not just believe in the Messiah, but have put their faith in action and have put their weight behind doing what is right, listening to him intently, right? As he says back in John, those who are seeing ongoingly and believing have they only in life. Now, Lord, he's open on the last day. Well, that's in John, you know, 640. Okay. Okay. Well, then, well, how about those who are into the, into the call out ones? Well, there's two movements. That's why it's different. It shows clearly two movements that are both at an accelerated, they're both assuming a movement to Christ. You have to be in Christ to go into Christ. And you have to already have the mysteries to be into the, con the congregation, the called out ones. So the movement of progression of growth is hidden in the words into. That's why it's important. It's a massive deal. It's a massive deal. That's like saying, you know, freshmen are freshmen and sophomores are sophomores. And I tell you, I was, um, I, I was in Oak Ridge and I was in, um, in Valencia. What? No, it, it, no, 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 no. That, that one's college and one's high school, and you can't just say in. I was in two. It changes the idea of what you're talking about. The movement from being in to in two, and the movement of being into Christ versus into the called out ones. There's two different things, and, and that's what that means. So into can can you say it's being sanctified in Christ? In the sense that into means that you are. Uh, don't forget. So having been sanctified to sanctification. Having been sanctified past tense is when Christ sanctifies you in his blood, you're his child, okay? But into Christ, as sanctification, as your ongoing being sanctified, and ongoing being reconciled, that is, if you mean that one, yes. So into represents your ongoingly being sanctified and ongoingly being reconciled, you're into Christ. That, that's what that means. So I hope that makes sense with your, to answer your question. So I wouldn't say it's being sanctified. It's kind of a misnomer. You have to clarify what that means. I think I know what you mean, but I don't want to have that be said to others. You want to make sure you clarify. Past tense sanctification, Christ has set me apart forever with his blood. However I live, I'm still going to be seen as he paid my sin debt. My, my again, Captain Cream, my debt for sin has been paid for. I'm never going to be brought into account again for that. However, I'm going to be brought into account for how I live my life after that. And, and that's where the ongoing sanctification, reconciliation, renovation comes in. And that's where I would say, that's where you're into. If, you're, if you are living in a sense of the Holy Spirit convicting you, transforming you, leading you to righteousness, uh, ongoing sanctification, uh, reconciliation, renovation, then yes. Oh, you're online too. Oh, okay. Okay, so. I can see so, you. So, <laughs> so I, know, I know you were like, you know, omnipresent. All right, so. It's so, amazing, isn't it? So. So the reality is that, that that's what into Christ would mean is that it's not just, it's like an, I mean, it, it speaks to the ongoing process which the disciples played out right in front of us where they did trust in him and then they saw the way that he came in and then they said they believed into him. And so you have this, wow, it's pretty cool, man, that they, that, that they did, that even his own brothers, by the way, we just saw this in John 6, they were convincing him to go to Judea on the second time of the High Holy Days, the second time it came around, that you need to go there and say publicly what's, who you are. And, and obviously, if they didn't believe in him, why would they say that? Uh, boo, right? They, it, they didn't, they believed who he was. That's why they're saying, you need to go there and tell everybody publicly who you are. And, and he's like, you know, first of all, I've already done that. Second of all, um, you don't tell him what to do. <laughs> and, then, and then it says in, in John 6, it tells, it tells, or John 7, excuse me, in John 7, then it tells you, oh, by the way, it says, and his brothers did not believe into him. Wait, what a minute, what? Into him? Yes. 
because they believed in him, but they were more passive in their faith. They didn't do anything to put it into action, to follow after him, to, to listen to what he said, to do what he's saying. Because they, they're his own family raised up with him. They kind of had that little stigma there going on. So you see that in John chapter 7, the first five verses. Read it yourself. You don't have to believe me. You, you can see these things are clearly in Scripture that people want to, you know, say it's one thing and ju ju justify the fact that in, into, whatever. No, no, not tomato, tomato. They, they do mean things. And so when you get to page 7 again, back to this bride, uh, the bride's expected, back on page 7, is expected and inspected to be a spilos, which is spotless, and uh, a spiloi, excuse me, spotless, and an omentoi, blameless. There are two wedding feasts that I've mentioned here, and you can see this in, in, uh, in Luke um, 14, where it mentions both feasts, Ariston and Dikon. That's in verse 12, and, and you get in Matthew 22, verses 4 to 9, you have all those different times in which he mentions feast singular and feast plural. And we've gone through this before, but for those who would say, you know, I don't understand. So I want to make sure, this is kind of important because the first step, the first two steps to showing somebody that there is a bride of Christ separate from those that are in Christ is, is a couple of things to remind them of. N number one, do you, you have to agree there are different categories of people in Christ. They go, no, they're not. We're all the same. Okay, wait just see. So you have to agree just based on com not, not narratives, not my feelings, just on facts. Are there people in 1 Corinthians 3 called carnal? Yes. Are, are there people in 1 Corinthians 3 later on that have gold, silver, precious stones and some have wood, hand, stone? Well, yes. Those aren't the same, are they? N n no. Are there people in Hebrews 5 that are called um, teachers and those that should be teachers and they're not yet because they're on milk, they can't take solid food? Yes. Is there people in Ephesians 4.30 that can grieve the Holy Spirit? Yes. Is there people also in Ephesians 3 that he says, Awake from the dead, you sleeper, from dead works? Well, then, yes. Is there people that have an inheritance among those who have been sanctified? Yeah, I can go on and on. There are distinctive difference of categories of people in Christ. I don't care what your preacher, teacher, doctrinal theology, whatever it says. They're wrong. Who are you going to believe? The facts? You can, you can misunderstand what those things mean, but don't argue the facts. Those are clear, distinctive differences that show earmark that there is not a uniformity of socialism in God's eyes, how he sees his people. The blurring of the lines is this, is that there is, a, there is a swooping love that God gives to all those that believe in Jesus. That does not change. That's the part that they bastardize. That's the part that's true, but they bastardize it and they make it into something it's not. So it's, a, it's almost like what happens today in our social structure of our world today, for example. I have people I know that are homosexuals. Am I nice and loving to them? Yes. Am I kind to them? Yes. Do I have conversations with them? Yes. See, they think, not all, a lot of them think, if you do that, ergo, you agree with my lifestyle. No. I just like nice to you as a person. I disagree fully with your lifestyle. I just don't want to treat you like a piece of garbage. I'm not doing that. So then they go, okay, well then, if you if you if you disagree with me, then then you hate me. No, that's not true, either, right? But this is where Christianity has the same lie that Satan has lied, and they bought into it, and they put up like the same lie, because God loves everybody, and this general who's in Christ the same. Ergo, we're all the same in heaven. No, no, you're bastardizing it. I can love somebody and show them kindness and disagree with their lifestyle. God can show love to you, but be disagreeable, disapproving of your lifestyle. <gasps> right? People don't understand that. I mean, how do you not understand that? And, and, and by the way, let me show you something else. Um, a little off topic, but not so much. But another little eye-opener for people that, that I, 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 another colloquialism of Christianity that's a lie. How many times you heard this? You're supposed to love the sinner and hate the sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, okay. Well then, I got a question for you, preacher man. Uh, when you say that, can you help me understand this, this particular song? Because I, I struggle with what you're saying. I'm reading this and I'm trying to figure out what, what, what that means. So when you just said love the sinner and, and, and hate the sin, so I'm looking into the Psalms and, and I could, I'm reading this. Let me see, I'm gonna find it. Um, yeah, so it says here um, in verse, but chapter 2 of the book of Psalms, he says that um, you kiss the son lest he be angry and perish from the way from his wrath is kindled. Blessed are they who put their trust in him. 
So my first question is, I thought you said God loves everybody. It just says here, kiss the son, lest he be angry. Hmm. In the New Testament, he says those who don't believe in Jesus have the wrath of God abiding on them already. Um, say what again? I thought God loved everybody. Here in Psalm 2, while well, they're in John 3, whether it's all the New Testament alike, God speaks of his wrath, his anger being on you if you don't make yourself right with Jesus. Um, excuse me? I got to, uh, um, what? Say, excuse me? That, that's not what you hear from the pulpit. There's another, I want to show you, show you something else where he, um, I'm going to show you where he talks about, uh, again, let me see here. Uh, I want to find, I, I was just, this is ad hoc, and I was trying to remember the verse in my mind, and I didn't remember it. I thought it was Psalm 5. Uh, oh, here it is. Okay, here it is. And, and Psalm 5.5, 5, the foolish shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. I, I thought that preacher said that you're supposed to hate the sin and not the sinner. God said he hates the sinner. I'm just trying to... He said workers of iniquity he hates. It didn't say what they do. Psalm 5.5, 5, I, uh, God, God does not stand, the foolish not stand in his sight. He hates all workers, all those doing iniquity, all those doing perverse things. I thought he hates the sin but loves the sinner. Can you explain Psalm 5.5 5 to me? I, I'm confused. H help me understand. Who am I supposed to believe? God or man? I'm, I'm going to go with God. No, thank you. I believe in you. And going back to that John passage again, I'm show you some more lies of Christianity. So, again, I mentioned to you in John 3, you said, that doesn't, you just, well, you just said that doesn't, that doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah, it does. So, in John, in John 3, in John 3, he says, it's right there for you to see, in John chapter 3, when he talks about um, getting this couple of verses in, in this uh, John 3, you go down to, let me see here, um, we go right to um, verse 36. He believing into the Son has aeonian life, and he, and he disobeying the Son shall not see life, but the anger of God abides on him. Um, what was that? What do you mean? I thought God loves everybody. Why is God's anger abiding on you? I don't. That means constantly remains on you. That's in John six thirty six. So it says he believing into the Son has life, faith, lasting, and he disobeying the Son. These are folks who are knowing who he is that disobey him. Does it sound like God still loves it? It doesn't sound that way to me. I don't know what the preacher is telling you. I'm just asking. Why, why are you saying things that are not, that are against what God's saying? I'm just, just asking, like, why would you say things like this? Right? Since we're in the book of John, glance over to yourself over in John 3, verse 29, and you'll see John the Baptist make a comment. The bridegroom is he who possesses the bride. But that friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices with joy because of the bridegroom's voice. This, therefore, my joy has been completed. And this goes on the cusp of my favorite life verse, he must increase and I must decrease. But my question is, is really interesting. If there is no difference, we would have no need for teachers or preachers. That's right. There is a difference. We need to help out, right? That's what the Ethiopian eunuchs asked to fill up. I need someone to help explain this to me. And so here you have, in verse 29 of John 3, John the Baptist mentioned the bride. He, no one talks about Jesus being a bridegroom. But nobody except for him. Uh, what is that about? Like, what is that? What is that about? How does he even know that? Do you actually think he's talking about Jesus getting married? No, he does not talk about that. So, which tells you, guess what? And by the way, don't forget, John the Baptist was was influential, and he he was a unique human. People were dead spiritually until Jesus died, rose again from the dead, and he said, "I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to send you another, not a helper, another helper." Which means he was a helper. And now you have another helper, which goes back to when you quench the Holy Spirit, you can also, you can, you can also, you can actually, no, grieve the Holy Spirit, excuse me. You can grieve the Holy Spirit, but you can quench the Spirit of Christ. There are two different spirits. You say, what do you base that on? Because there's two helpers. I didn't write the book, but read it carefully. People can tend to always go, Jesus is Jesus, and the Holy Spirit's our helper. No, 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 no. Jesus is our helper. He's our savior, our deliverer, and he's our, it's one of his names as a helper because he said, I'll send you another helper, which means he's a helper. And who can argue with that? Of course he is. And so is the Holy Spirit. So, but the point I'm making to you here is in John 3, he tells you that 
John the Baptist is mentioning that Jesus is the bridegroom. Well, look, look at else what, what is unique about John. Go back to Luke just for a minute. Let me show you uniqueness about John that no one else can say this about themselves. And it's pretty, pretty wild. It's pretty wild. But when you go to in, in John, uh, not John, Luke, in the book of Luke chapter 2, speaking of this whole bride of Christ issue and distinctive differences, if you go to Luke chapter 2, you will see that when Mary, the, the Virgin Mary, is impregnated with, with Jesus, or said to be pregnant with Jesus, she's told it's going to happen. She then shares the news with Elizabeth. She just shares the news with her. Oh, by the way, that I've been chosen to be impregnated by the Holy Spirit with the Messiah. She's like, say what? <laughs> so, and then, you know, this whole exchange happens. But in verse of, of Luke chapter 2, and then you get into, oh, sorry, I was in the wrong... Is it Luke 2? No, sorry. I said Luke Luke 2. I was wrong. It's um, Luke 1, I believe. Let me see. Where am I at now? Where am I at? Sorry, sorry. Let me just find it real quick. I lost my eyes for a second. I could have sworn it was. Okay. Where am I missing my eyeballs here? Yeah, it's Luke 1, not 2. What am I thinking? Sorry, I was thinking of Simon, Simeon, and I was reading the wrong thing. Sorry. It's Luke chapter 1. My apology. Luke chapter 1. And you're, we're in verse 41. And when Elizabeth, which is John the Baptist's mom, when she heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And what happened to Elizabeth? She's filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow your roll. How? She's dead spiritually. Everybody is. And so Jesus dies on the cross and rises from the dead. Well, well, what that means? How, how, how that happens? So John the Baptist was the vessel from which, was the vehicle from which he left for joy and it led to her being filled with the Holy Spirit. It didn't say she did it on her own, or God just did it on his own right to her. He, he definitively used this babe, who was John the Baptist, to leap for joy and use that to make her feel with the Holy Spirit. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering, uh, what's the big deal about that? Oh, because later on, go to John, go to Luke, if you saying John. Luke chapter 1, verse 67. So John the Baptist is the key figure that God uses to fill his mother with the Holy Spirit. He all, God doesn't stop there. He uses him also as the key figure, the vessel from which his father, Zechariah, filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 1, verse 67. And Zechariah, his father, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Wait, so what? So, so what? what? So, you, he, <laughs> I don't think you understand the gravity of these statements because you don't, I don't, I didn't understand it myself. You got to really, <laughs> these are people that are spiritually dead. No one has ever been filled with the Holy Spirit until Jesus rose from the dead. And here is Zachariah, his dad, after his mother Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit first. How can that be when they're spiritually dead? The Holy Spirit resides in no one. B because they're different and unique. And that was why Jesus said no one is greater than John the Baptist. It isn't just his quality of life that he lived. It's the spiritual blessing of God's hand on him and how he was a tremendous effect. He had a tremendous effect and he infected positively the spiritual realm with his mother and with his father. That, 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 I'm telling you, he wasn't even able to say his name. He was, he's still a, he's a fetus, for crying out loud, and his mother filled with the Holy Spirit. Then when he's born, his dad is filled with the Holy Spirit because he was able to say his name. When they asked him to say, what's his name, John? And then he says that it's unbelievable. It, it's just unbelievable that you have a, a, a human being God uses to really show us a distinctive difference. And my, also, my other point about that is, He's so unique that he has been used to fill his mother and father with the Holy Spirit before people were made even alive in spirit. But not just that. So how is that happening? I, I contend to you, I, don't, I can't prove it by chapter and verse, but just by putting things together, I can conjecture based on factoids that John the Baptist had a unique understanding of the mysteries the Holy Spirit taught him personally before Jesus even was teaching. He, 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 which, by the way, then would explain um, the old adage if Jesus continued what John the Baptist was teaching, and Jesus began to teach, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and the kingdom of heavens is about the mysteries, then John the Baptist named mysteries. Holy. So how did he know that? Because no one knows that unless Jesus teaches you, unless he did. So, don't, so how taught him? The Holy Spirit must have taught him. I'm, I'm telling you, he was like a precursor of the Apostle Paul. He had a private, one-on-one -on -one tutoring that no one knew about. The Holy Spirit had endowed upon him knowledge and insight and understanding that was beyond compare. And it showed this on his little childhood birthing from his fetus in the womb to his original birth. And mother and dad were affected by it. And he shows his, 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 his 
results of having this knowledge by what he was preaching and by the statement of calling Jesus a bridegroom. You tell me how. How is he able to teach the kingdom of the heavens is at hand since we know Jesus said those are mysteries that are only given as a privilege. Then how did he get it? How did he get it? If Matthew 13, 11 says you're known the mysteries of the kingdom of the heavens, then how is he teaching it? What, what's he talking about? How did he even know that? How did he know that? Jesus was, he wasn't around Jesus' was teaching. He introduced the, the, and the Messiah to begin his teaching. So how did he know that? Isn't that crazy? And then he also tells him a bridegroom. How would you know that? What do you t- how do you know that? <laughs> you know? Because the Holy Spirit told him that. Well, how do I know the Holy Spirit's different in his life? Uh, evidence A, his mom is filled with the Holy Spirit. That ain't normal. Because no one, you can't be. You're spiritually dead. How is that happening? It must be some uniqueness that God used in, in that little baby's life. And how about his father? Same way. I mean, come on. The evidence is clear to me that there's something that went on there we don't know about in the blank spaces that the Holy Spirit taught John the Baptist. And Jesus coins it best when he says there's no one greater a born woman before or after John the Baptist. To make it even more clear to you that, just so you all know, he's unique. So Jesus' statement also is, a, well, it's just because he's the prayer of the way. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but there's a lot of more. The other folks spoke about the Messiah to come. He was definitely unique. I get it. But was it just that, or was it that plus a lot more? And I'm telling you, there seems to be, the more I'm, I didn't understand that myself, until you start reading into this and you start realizing, and it's just, wow, he, has a, he was blessed very much by God to see things that no one else saw, especially in the time frame before the, the crucifixion, before the resurrection. It's a wow, very big wow. So going back to page seven, there are different wedding feasts. And so when you see that, you don't want to go to Matthew. So you go to page eight now, but as we, before we go there, I want to, if you, one of the things people need to understand about the bride of Christ issue is to understand the uniqueness of John the Baptist, right? You see the uniqueness there of him. And then also I want you to see the uniqueness of the fact that um, there are two wedding feasts. They got to see there's two wedding feasts. Ask the average person in Christ. Most, most people I ask them, I say, do you, do you know what a wedding feast is? And I'll be honest with you, it's about a coin flip. You, you'd be shocked, but just, don't believe me. Try it yourself. Ask the average person in Christ, hey, you familiar with the wedding feast? They'll go, what's that? I mean, not, not, not for Susie Q and John Doe getting married. I'm not like in, in Christ, the spiritual and the Bible. They'll go, what? Most folks don't know. I'm just telling you, they have no clue. Half of them are like, wait on them. Another half are like, yeah, 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 the RSVP, you're invited, the dinner table, we're all going to have some good times. We're going to have some good times, you know. Okay, but very few understand that there's what it is. I have to view what it is, and very few, if any, understand there's two of them. They two of them. Well, yeah. And then they don't, they don't know where it takes place at. Was it take place? Ask them. You know, the wedding feast is. Then ask them if it take place in heaven or earth. Ask them when it take place. Is there more than one? Those are the questions you want to ask people. And that gets them to thinking. What's your point about this? Well, my point is that if you don't know what those questions, those answers, the answers to those questions are, you might not understand well how it is why you're generalizing that everybody in Christ is the bride of Christ. And I just answer. I just basically set them up for questions and ask questions. Okay, I, I tell them up front. So I'm going to entrap you right now. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to entrap you right now, but I want not for evil purposes and nefarious reasons, but to have a little fun to show us how we are all captured captives of man-made thoughts and traditions in our brain. And they go, okay, okay. So I'm ask you a question: Is who's at the marriage feast? And then they would tell me that the people in Christ. Okay, is there any way that somebody who is lost, as you would say, doesn't know Jesus? Could they be there? No. Okay, could a Jewish person who knows about Jesus but not believe he's the Messiah, could they be there? No. Okay, are you sure? Yeah, okay. What if, what if, what if I don't know Jesus but my family member does or my husband or my wife does and because I'm married to them, because I'm a child to them, can I sneak in on their coattails even though I never believed in Jesus as my Savior? Could that happen? Because I'm related by blood or family or marriage. No. Okay, could I pay off an angel a little something, something on the side and be like, hey man, let me in, bro. Could, could that happen? They called that's funny. No. Okay. Could could I have slipped by the cracks and God was judging so many people? There's so many billions of people God's judging. I slipped through the cracks and I snuck in by the side because God talks about the thief sneaking in, right? So what if I snuck in? Could I sneak in? And they go, No, you're being ridiculous, man. You're being silly. Okay, fine. So we also to to, to be could be clear. Only people in Christ could be at a marriage feast. Is that correct? And they go, correct. Okay. Go to Matthew 22. Explain to me verse 11 to 14. And they go, and they start reading. Matthew 22, verse 11 to 14. And they go there, 
And the king, having entered in the view of the guest, saw a man not clothed with wedding garment. And he says to him, Friend, how comest thou not having a wedding garment? And he was struck speechless. And the king said to the servants, Find him hand and feet, take him in the thrust him out of darkness, and they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are chosen. It's, it says many are called, few are chosen. No, it should say many are, are ekletoi, and few are ekletoi. Meaning fewer, many are called, few are called out. Wait a second. I changed the narrative of Christianity. Remember, remember, God calls the whole world, and if you're in Christ, you're called out. I thought only a few are called out, Jesus just said in Matthew 22, 14. Because that's their language. I don't care what the King James says. Many are called, few were chosen. That's a lie. It's many are clay toy and few are ecle toy. Many are called, few are called out. So here's my question. Um, who's the guy? Who, who's the person who was struck speechless? And by the way, I don't see any flames of fire. He's not going to some hell. He goes to outer darkness, and he's also bound hand and foot. I just got questions. I got questions. And they go, I don't, I, I don't know who that is. Well, is he slot? No, no, no. You can't, well, no, I made it very clear to you that there was no way in Hades, we all agree that that person can't be there unless he's already in Christ. Don't try to reverse engineer because you're stuck with not understanding what the words mean. Well, parables aren't really the word of God. No, no, no. We already established yesterday in our study, in this person's case, previously in the conversation, that every word of God matters. You don't throw out parables. Nice, nice try. I don't care what he's saying. Every word matters. There's no fill-ins or throwaways. So, what does it mean? And they don't, they don't know what to say. So, did you, did you maybe entertain the idea? Forget all the details, but just basic facts. A person has to be there to be, to be there, you have to be in Christ. If this person's in Christ, and they're bound hand and foot and cast out, and Jesus concludes you with many are called and few are called out, did you probably, did you, do you potentially see there's a distinctive difference between those in Christ who have a good experience and those who have a bad experience? Could, could, you, could you agree with that? They go, well, yeah, but it's scaring me. I, okay. So, but you also see a distinctive difference. You could say it this way. Some are not as blessed as they thought they would be, and some will be. Oh, okay. And that's what the concept is behind the bride of Christ. And they go, what? I, you tell me what it means. If it doesn't mean people in Christ are different, distinctive differences, and some have a different experience than others, then what does it mean then? And specific, not to just heaven and hell or... Or, or the Bema seat. It's specific to a marriage feast experience. So I'm just trying to figure out how is he even there? And going back to the singular and plural, you can see that throughout the entire chapter. There's a singular and plural. We've been through this before, but in chapter 22, it's singular and plural. Singular and plural. Yep, those are called ones and called out ones. The oi, that's right. There's those correct. So when he says many, there's, there's those clay, those um, Clay to those uh, those many are those alloy for are clay toy, but few are clay toy. So to your point, Sister Pam, he's pointing out from those who are called out and from those who are called. Remember, there's two callings. There's the calling you have to live, like he says in Romans 8, 28, complies with John 14, 21. He has my commandments and keeps them. He that loves me, John 14, 21. Then Romans 8, 28 says, all things brought together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So he qualifies what a called person is, is he who loves God. He previously qualified what loving God means, not an emotion. It's having his commandments, which you spend time in his word, and then actually doing them. So it's obedience. So you love God through obedience. You can't obey God unless you understand his word, spend time in it. So you have to know his word, do his word, then you obey him. If you obey him, you show you love him. When you love him, he names you a called one. So from that called one status, then you get a klegoi, chosen, to then get another calling to the heavenly experience of the inheritance. And it's from those clay toy, those called ones, and thank you for clarifying the specificity of this, it's two callings. These called ones are the second callings, not the first ones that are called. So he's talking about, so they're, well, I'm, I'm, I'm obeying Jesus, so, so am I going to be at the marriage feast? No. Because it's not, it's not, it's not, it's the, it's it's not the clay toy of. There, there's klesis, which is a call, but there's clay toys. So those particular call ones he's talking about in this context are those that are called in the marriage feast. Because always at the end of it always means a group within a bigger group. So <laughs> there's another little tell that makes you gotta go whoa. So there's two group, there's two callings. Yes, yes. So this group here that's being called is from those who are called to the heavenly experience. 
and those who are actually then, that's when they get the mystery sewn to them. Then you have this, of those clay toy. Well, what, what, those, what, what clay toy? Those who actually have, again, few are selected, because we know of the clay toy, who are those? 30, 60, and 100. And where do the foolish come from? The 30. So of the clay toy, only the 160 are going in. The 30, there's a big sloth of them that aren't going in. That's what he means by, of those clay toy. A few are selected from those clay toys. From the clay toy of 30, 60, 100, only the 60 and 100 are guaranteed a passage way in. Some of those 30 may or may not get in. Oh, wait, what? Yeah! That's what he's talking about. Just so you're clarifying. I love you brought that out. I'm sorry that I didn't emphasize that before. This occurs at the end of the Aristotle. Yep. Which helped me to see why this guy didn't have his wedding garment. Yep. Plus God the Father inspected the guests. Yep. That's right. That's it. Right? So... Then you go back to our go back to our, our paper again on page eight, and I wrote this um, convoluted equal sign thing that <laughs> just today goes. You got to clear, clean that up, right? Kind of thing. And I, I apologize. Sometimes I I say or write things that aren't as clear as they intend to be or need to be or should be. But on top page eight it says each are one day in heaven, one thousand each are for one day in heaven, thousand years on earth. Meaning the one day in heaven is equivalent to one day on earth, one thousand years on earth which is transpiring over a 2,000 year period, meaning for the day of the Lord, that's one day in heaven, 1,000 years on earth, and one day, the day of the God, one day in heaven, 1,000 years on earth, ergo, those are two days equaling 2,000 years, which is what Second Peter uh, chapter 3, 8 to 14 is saying. I could have worded that a little better, I agree with that, and I apologize for my, you know, blah, 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 but I'm, I'm <laughs> thanks for pointing it out though. So that put on retaining her garment spotless, during the Aristotle feast millennial reign period. Well, this is what the bride of Christ is doing. While also making another garment of righteous works for a Dyton wedding feast. Now this is what comes up. People say, people say, well, and, and, and going back to this, here's what I get you the idea of Christianity. This is what you're going to be posed with. So if you go to Matthew 5 and you read this comment, all of a sudden it, 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 you get challenged by where you're going to go to? Knee jerk churchianity, or you're going to start to delve into what does that mean? Because don't do the knee-jerk reaction, just responding from a traditional answer. Stop, stop and think about it for a second. So go to chapter 5 of Matthew for a minute, and I'm going to show you how this word righteousness, how the bride's righteousness is different, but how churchianity frames it differently. And I'll tell you how and why. Because right here in chapter 5 of Matthew, verse 19 and 20, Jesus said, therefore whoever shall inviolate one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men also will be called little or least in the kingdom of the heaven. So wait a second, wait, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. So you get, okay, so <laughs> so you're telling me there's people who do wrong and still get to go into the kingdom of the heaven. They're just least. Okay, that's interesting. And you're also teaching people to do it. Uh, okay, that's interesting. And then he says, but whoever shall practice and teach them shall be called great. So wait a minute, Jesus. You made it very clear for all the preacher teacher denominations who are lying to me they're telling me everybody's the same. You just got finished saying there's little and great in the kingdom of the heavens. So he just said that. I don't care how you want to interpret it. That, that's what he said. That there's two distinctive peoples. It's pretty clear. There's no socialism in heaven. He made that very clear. Or in this case, excuse me, the kingdom of the heavens. Right? So then you go into verse 20. For I tell you that unless you're, here's where it gets interesting. Here's where church Andy comes in. And they say, for, for I tell you that unless your righteousness excel that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall never enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what they then incur, they infer here is, oh, that's because they, you can't get into heaven without the righteousness of Christ. That's what he's talking about, because they conflate heaven and kingdom of the heaven as the same thing. And they take the King James Version, which uses the word heaven in the singular, but it's not, it's in plural. How do I know that? Says who? Says, says the language, not me. I'm just an idiot. I didn't write the Koine Greek language. I can't even speak it. Are you kidding me right now? I just go by what I see. When the suffix ends in W of V, and it does, it is plural. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy New Year. That's what it is. So I didn't write it. So when he says heavens, which is W of V ending, the kingdom of the heavens, you see that, that's a plural. It should be an S. Well, my King James says a singular. It's wrong. I'm sorry to tell you that. It's wrong. Once again, what a surprise. Why are you shocked by this? I've already proven to you it's inefficient, erroneous translation. Because it's English. No offense to the King James. Of English, it's fantastic. 
But when it's used for study, only when it's used to, to leverage the concordance does it come in handy. Other than that, you don't study from it as like the words itself, no. So when you go to this verse 20, unless your righteousness succeed or excel, they take it as, okay, um, that means Jesus has to die and rise from the dead, and now your righteousness to Jesus is imputed onto you, you get to go to heaven. That's what it means. The righteousness is Jesus who died for you, he gave it to you, and that's how you get to heaven. Because we all know that. Because our righteousness, it, that's how, that's what it means. It means that he, he did it for us and we get to go to heaven. He. Okay, what about the first before it though, where he said little and great? What, what's that about? Um, um, <laughs> go ahead, I got all day. Walk, walk me through it. <laughs> well, um, it just means like rewards, you know? Okay, why would someone, you said they live a certain way to get to heaven, to prove you're going to heaven. This person, it says in verse 19, is violating and teaching others, doesn't say he goes to hell. He's just little. So, so explain yourself. Um, go to the next verse. Okay, no, no. <laughs> so you got to explain what that means, bro. What, what that means? What, what what it means? What it means? So they well, um, the yeah. The, oh, by the way, you know what that means? He's talking about kingdom of heaven does deal with those. And by the way, the, the chaff who Jesus John the Baptist says separates the wheat from the chaff. That happens at the beginning of the millennial reign. Separating the wheat from the tares happens at the end of the millennial reign. And so the wheat and chaff are the chaff are the people that were sown the mysteries and did nothing with it. Like the guy in Luke 19 when he said, oh, hide it in the dirt because I know you were a harsh man. Uh, that's exactly why you shouldn't have done that. And now that's your butt. He's like, what do you mean? Bend over, Jack. And he said, bring, bring those people before me, my citizens before me, he said in Luke 19, 27, Bring them before me that they want me to reign over them so I can slaughter them. Do what now? You heard me. And they're like, <laughs> here they go. And that's not funny. That that's they're not are they saved? Did they have the mystery? So it's like in heaven's is in view? Yes. Did they violate? Did they pay a price for it? Won't you ask them when they stand before Jesus and that you have to deal with that? They're gonna tell you it's not funny. They're gonna feel like, yeah, I got mysteries. I don't feel so great though, and this I'm, I'm there. They're, they're, they're knowing they should have been there, and they're just separated as the chaff from the wheat, and they're confined down to this earth at the very best case, or worst case, even worse, under the earth. And that's what's going on here. So anyway, go back to now, people say, well, the righteousness is all of Jesus. They're not going to show you another one. I'll show you it back in Titus. Go to Titus chapter 3, where I get the right, you know, left, right punch to the face about what it really means. Go to chapter 3 of Titus in verse 5. Chapter 3 of Titus, he says, He saved us. He saved us, not on account of those works and righteousness that we did. So i got a question for you. How can you do righteous works when you're not saved? Because it says He saves us. He saved us. So, how can I do works of righteousness before I'm saved? In, in Titus 3, 5, He saved us, but not on account of those works and righteousness which we did, but according to His own mercy, Okay, wait, what now? <laughs> so, so there was some righteousness that was being done prior to them. That's why he said, righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Which he's telling you back in Matthew, he's telling you in Titus, there are righteous actions you can do. How could the Jews do righteous works? The only way they could do that is to obey the law of Moses. That's it. Not of their own accord, their own traditions. If you obey the law of Moses, you obey what God told you to do. If you did what God told you to do, that's a work of righteousness. Even though you're dead in your sins, even though you're dead spiritually, that's how you're able to perform work of righteousness. There is no other way. You can't say, I asked Cain about it. Well, I felt really good about my, my crop, and so I, was, I felt good about it. And God's like, I don't care what you thought about it, moron. I didn't tell you to bring forth a crop as your sacrifice, and you darn well know it, and you're done. And so... Here you have here, when he says in Matthew 5, 19 and 20, Titus 3, 5, there's clearly a righteousness of people. There aren't the righteous, that, yeah, but I'm just pointing out to you, there's righteous works. In this case, I'm not delineating between called out ones or sparse people at this point. I'm just trying to show you the basic tenet that churchianity says righteous work, righteousness imputed to you is, is the righteousness in Scripture is always speaking of Jesus, what he did for you. That's the righteous work. They always want to impute that on you. But yet, they don't want to delineate. That's true, but it's also true that Jesus, God, 
they, the Bible speaks to righteousness of Jesus imputed to you and of the works that you do. They're both true. But church Danny goes, no, that last part's not true. It's only Jesus' righteousness in your life, and that's how you produce those works. Then how did the Pharisees have righteousness? Because Jesus said that you have to excel. Not, he didn't say do opposite of them. He said to excel, which means they were doing righteous works. They were obeying the law of Moses in some ways. In other ways, they were bastardizing it. In other ways, they were hypocritical, hypocritical about it. They had mixed works. They had wood, hay, and stubble mixed with some other righteous works. So I'm just pointing out that it's imputed. They want to lie to you and say, it's only Jesus in your life who does righteous works. Well, they're not Jesus in their life. How do they do righteous works? In Titus 3, 5, they weren't even saved yet. They had righteous works. So how do you explain this? Right? So righteous works are not just Jesus in your life. It is based on that's the basic premise, absolutely. But before Jesus in your life, giving you the ability to have righteous works, the only way you could do it before is by doing what God told you to do, which means only a Jew could do that. A Gentile couldn't do that. They had no idea what God was saying. Only a Jew could do a righteous work before. Not a Gentile. They had no clue. They didn't know that they knew what to do. They didn't know how. They had to know the how, the what, the when. And they had to do it the right way, and then God's like, okay, that's a righteous work. Because you did what I said, when I said, how I said it, that's a righteous work. How could it not be? You're obeying God, right? If you're dead spirit or not, you're obeying God, that's righteous. That's why he called Noah righteous, right? It's obeying God. So when you get to this point of now, so you fast forward to Revelation. About the bride now. How does this relate to the bride? Well, for those people who say to me, well, the righteousness exceeding the Pharisees, he's not talking about different people in Christianity. He's just saying that all of us in Christianity are greater than those who are Jewish because all right, we have Jesus' righteousness and that's why we have to go to heaven. That's not what he's saying and you darn well know it. But they make heaven, the kingdom of the, kingdom of the heavens, the same thing. But in Revelation, in chapter 19, when he said, we may rejoice in verse 7, 19 and 7, 8 and 9, we may rejoice and exalt and give glory to him because the marriage lamb of, of his wife has prepared herself, and it was given to her she should be clothed in fine linen and pure, bright and pure and fine linen, and represents the what? The righteous acts of the saints. Oh, righteous acts of Jesus? No, of the saints. So it's their works, right? Isn't that what Jesus said too, right? Behold, I'm coming quickly to give each one according to my righteousness. Nope, that's not what he said. According to their works. Say what again, Jesus? You heard me. Your works. Are they unrighteous? Or are they righteous? This is where people in Christ get like confused because the church Christianity has lied to them. So the bride of Christ, they're people that understand this distinctive difference, that they have a huge benefit of God giving them a huge love benefactor of his righteousness imputed to them. Now we could quench, we could grieve that Holy Spirit of righteousness in our life. We could quench the, quench the Spirit of Christ after we're already producing righteousness and refuse to go any further. We could do both those things. But the bride of Christ are people that understand, no, 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 no. You've got to continue to be, as he described, fine linen, bright, pure, and do this as righteous acts of, of, the, of those saints. And that's why the next verse speaks to a dikon in verse 9. We saw this from the Q&A review we did of Revelation, Brother Todd's question about this. That's the second marriage feast. We know that because the word dikon is used in verse 9 of Revelation, 20, or Revelation 19. So let me go back to our back to our context here of when I mean, we go back to this um, the feast. I, I just I mentioned a couple of things here, but you can also go to First Peter chapter two, verse eleven and twelve. First Peter chapter two, verse eleven and twelve. First Peter two, eleven and twelve, when he says, Beloved, I entreat you. Um, as strangers and sojourners to abstain from fleshy, from fleshy lusts which war, which wage war against the life, having your conduct upright among the Gentiles, so that in what they may speak against you as evildoers, from the good works, and, and this is the callous, the external works, the out of your agathos disposition, which they behold, they may glorify God in what? In the day of inspection. <laughs> um, that's the end of the Aristotle. And by the way, who's the audience in First Peter? It's everybody in Jesus. No, we already talked about that yesterday. No, it's not. It's, that's in that's in first that's in First Peter chapter two, verse eleven and twelve. That's on page eight of the paper, or on the second paragraph. But the first part of chapter one of First Peter, we saw from yesterday, 
he's talking to those that are again who are they he says according though he's writing to these called out ones that have a that have been for the foreknowledge they're an obedience they have been begotten we didn't see this yesterday actually we saw second peter but it's just a for those that does this verse chapter one of first peter verse two those are the called out ones the ekletos toys of the foreknowledge in order to obedience in verse two right to, in, to, to sanctification and spirit in order to obedience and a sprinkling of the blood May favor and peace be multiplied, which means be not just the original being in Christ, their ongoing growth. He gave us great mercy in verse 3 and has done what? Now it's the phrase born again. These people have been born again. You say, well, what that means? Well, that means that everybody in Christ is not born again. This happens later. So this happens later when you already are in Christ, begotten by him. Then you get renovated, then you have a birth from above. I mean, a new birth, excuse me, a new birth. Then you get chosen, you get a birth from above. Then from your birth from above of seeing the, 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 the mysteries, then you bear fruit from it, and then you start to be born again because it's an ongoing tense mention. It's ongoing. You continually have these new, like, revelatory, inspirational, like, spiritual, revela- spiritual uh, revivals, if you will, internally to yourself with God and His Spirit. It's unbelievably awesome. And everybody wants to tell me it's everybody in Christ who has this. Oh, please. There's so many folks in Christ that can't even spell the word Gospels, let alone understand what an epistle is. So that's the, that's the husband or wife of an apostle. Oh, my gosh. Adios, me. It just means latter, dude. Okay? It's all me. So people have, they don't, they don't know what a marriage feast is. They, they don't know what a bema seat is that are from the great white throne. They never heard of it before. There's so many folks that don't know nothing about nothing. And I'm not making fun of them. It's because they, know, they weren't taught. And, and if, this, if the student has, there's a whole Howard Hendricks, I think he's dead now, the guy from Dallas Seminary, his book called The Treasure Teacher, he said, if the student hasn't learned, the teacher hasn't taught. So stop blaming the student. It's the teacher's fault. Teacher's fault. It's, it's my fault. If you don't know something, now, I'm not responsible if you just want to be lazy and ignorant and not care. That's on you. But, but if, that, if I'm telling you the truth and you don't want to learn, that's on you. But if I'm not telling the truth, I'm not giving you the tools, then that's on me. And that's what Jesus is talking about by being a teacher, you're accountable. So th- this whole process of seeing this is just a different thing. So go to also um, Revelation 3.5, I mentioned. Revelation 3.5 about the bride of Christ. See this also distinctive difference <clears throat> when he is talking about when he said the conqueror or the overcomer, Revelation 3.5 talking to Sardis, will be clothed in white garments. Huh, interesting. White garments, and that's plural. Why she have two garments? Because she has the one from the Ariston and she has the one from the Dipnon. Ha <laughs> Hello. It didn't say white garment, plural. Uh-uh. There's two garments. That's Revelation 3, 5. And I will by no means blot out his name from the book of life. But wait a second. I thought the book of life was for everybody in Jesus. Then why would you be blotted out of it then? Why even bring it up? If you're in Christ and your salvation is guaranteed, and it is, why bring it up as an option to be blotted out of it? Like another conundrum with churchianity. They go, um, um, um. It's those that think they're saved and not, no, 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 no. We already covered this. He's talking to people that are, that you, they claim everybody who's called out once, everybody believes in Jesus. At least they got that part right. It refers to only folks who believe in Jesus. It doesn't refer to just that lower level, but at least they got the concept right. It's not a building. But when it comes to verses like this, they turn it into a building when they say, not everybody in church is saved, though. No, no, no. You already made it clear to us that called out ones are everybody in Christ. You just can't, you can't make it into a meaning of a building and unsaved and saved are in there. And that's why those don't overcome because they're not really saved. No, no. N- nice word art. Nice try. Try again, uh, Mr. Politician narration. That's wrong. You can't keep doing that. But they do. They, they double talk out of their mouth because they don't understand what, what the words mean. It's people in Christ that are being blotted out of this book. And I will confess their name in the presence of the Father and the presence of his angels. Again, that is uh, insane. So during the transition, when the Son rises up from his great white throne to go into the heavenly throne, the Father has a day of inspection. There's an exchange there where they're both there at the same time. He confesses, and then when Jesus is done confessing your name as your bride, as his bride and as the Father presents you, when that little process is done, then the Father comes down and sits on the throne down on earth for day eight, the day of the God. That, I don't want to have Jesus in front of God the Father uh, uh, deny me. That, that's not fun. I wouldn't want to 
bring you along. That's what that's what Matthew 24 is about when he says two are in the field, one's taken and one's left. It means taken alongside and one is turned away. Ooh, ooh, ah, ay, ay, ay. One's at the bema seat and one's at the at this point of the day of inspection. At both cases, you're going to see a bema seat. People accepted, people turned away. At the inspection, people accepted, people turned away. Whoa! You don't see that being taught. That's what it means, by the way. One taken, other left is a bad English translation. It means one taken alongside of and one turned away. Oof, oof, ugh, ay, ay, ay. That, that's heart piercing, you know? It's heart piercing. But that's what happens to people. So you go back to, so you go back to this, what does this bride of Christ look like? Well, I wish I could measure up to this, but guess what? I don't. Is there, is there only a book of life for day, um, for day eight? No, the book of life, so the book of life as a representation uh, for those who have an entrance, it's for, an, it's for an entrance or inheritance um, for inheritance for those of the called out ones, which is what's in view in, in, in the church letters, right? That's who they are. And then it's when at the great white throne, when it's being presented, opened up, it's in reference to those who enter or inherit the day of the God. So it's used in both cases. It's used to either um, enter, you can actually even say, it's used to enter and inherit in both cases. It's either enter or inherit in day seven, or enter or inherit into day eight. And so, but those in reference to the church letters, they just don't want to enter. They want to, because they get to enter at first with inheritance later, right? But the great white throne and the bema seat both have in view the same idea, which is if you're not in the book of life, you're not going to be at one who enters or inherits. But the purpose for entering is that you want to at least have that for the end in mind of gaining your inheritance. You don't want to just settle for an entrance. Uh-uh. You, you, you have that for the idea of inheritance. It's just like when I enter into the reading of the will, I'm a son of a billionaire. I don't want to be entering the room to hear the reading of the will just to hear it. I want to enter the room to hear the fact that I want good things said about me by said grandpa who left me got zillion billion dollars, right? I'm not just there to go, I want to hear what Grandpa said. No, I want to be able to know that what the inheritance is, how he thought about me. If that's, that's not my case, don't get me wrong. But that's why there's a great, um, there's that great thing, a movie I told you about, The Inheritance, I think it's called. It's a great James Gardner movie where that, 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 that guy uh, has that whole work picture. It's based on like Christian principles. I, I love that movie, it's great. Great principle of thought. So anyway, going back to this page eight, um, and, we're looking at these character traits of what the bride uh, should have, right? And I hope you guys like this show. I, we, we liked it a lot, it was great. Um, so you have this joyful, gentle, peaceful with Christ through it all and heart and mind. Not saying you are this, these are things that the bride of Christ has in their, has in their target and has in their, their, their sphere of their mindset. This is what the goal is to accomplish. This is what I want you to check me on. So if you say, Preston, you're not having a joyful, gentle, peaceful spirit in Christ in all your heart and mind, good that you call me on it. I'm not happy that, I, that, that I've been caught with my pants down, if you will, but I'm happy that you call me out on it. I want you to call me on that. I want you to call me out on that as a brother and sister in Christ. And you should want the same thing. If you want to be the bride of Christ, this is what the bride of Christ has as their character traits. And there's nobody who arrives at this. There's no one who sustains this. That's not the point. The point is you want to exhibit this, you want to strive for this, and you want to attain to this as much as possible, and you want to embody this as much as possible, knowing it's not an arrival, it's a constant falling and failing and fledgling along the way, but it's your goal, it's your aim, and you're doing things to accomplish it. It isn't just some, because they say, they say, you know what the difference between a dream and a goal is? A dream is something you can imagine without any objectives and measurables to get to that end. A goal is something you did the same thing on, but you put measurables and you put down things you're going to be doing to get to that end. That's the difference, right? You can dream all you want. Well, I dream I'm going to be the head of my own restaurant one day. Great. What are you doing about it, Billy? Well, I was dreaming I was cooking bread, man. It was the greatest thing ever. I was brisk in there, but I was here. Okay. Do you know how to cook yet? No, ma'am. It's going to come eventually, man. Do you even know what brisket is? No, man. I heard about it. Tastes it's good, man. It's good, you know. I won't make it myself, you know. What, dude, brother, man? Come on, have somebody get some plan together about going to cooking class or trying it yourself, teaching yourself, 
buy some brisket, do some things, burn, take people to taste it, they, see what's good. Come on, bro, do something. Don't, don't just, it's going to happen when it happens, man, you know what I'm saying? Oh, my gosh. But that's how people think about, if you can't be like that with the bride of Christ, you can't, well, I want to be joyful and gentle and peaceful with Christ. Great. You spend time in God's Word every day? Well, no, man, I just want to, but I want to have it, though, man. But that's not possible, man. That's just, that's just dumb. you got to do the actions behind it. So, and here he says, holding tightly. Next thing, holding tightly to cultivating a relationship with Jesus. We have to have that. Place higher, highest value on spiritual blessings over worldly needs. This isn't a list of things that say, this is what I am and what you are. And no, 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 no. It's a list that says, this is what the bride of Christ is like. It's like, it's this, this is the, this is the Jesus checklist of, this is what I expect of her to look like. And so you're like, but Jesus, I can't measure up to that. He goes, I know exactly. But you darn better sure be trying. You should put forth your every effort, your best effort. Give me your very best to, to hit these ends. And whether you fall short, he's going to judge you and judge us by the efforts of how often did we attain these things? How greatly did we sacrifice to get to this level of what he requires of these character traits? This is what the bride of Christ has. Place a highest value, remain uncompromised in our walk of faith. Have courage and strength to correct stumbling blocks in Christ. These are all based on things in scripture that I want to show you based on the letters to the churches, the called out ones. And continual strength, strengthening works of faith with diligent fruit yield. Produce a hundred fruit yield of sperma and continually stay teachable. Strive continually, don't become arrogant or presumptuous. Now, I don't know about you, you may say, these sound easy. No, I don't think so. They sound really hard to me. They sound real hard. But that's, so imagine the folks that say, the bride of Christ is for everybody. Well then, okay, so you're telling me the person, that anybody in Christ can do all these things? I'm a lot more longer in the tooth knowing Jesus, walking with him, and I've been blessed to know much about him and his word. And I'm telling you right now, I don't feel comfortable checking any of these boxes that says I got this down that, that, no but you're going to tell me someone who knows way 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 less than me and doesn't take it seriously at all qualifies for all this come on man that, that just is so disingenuous and you know it come on this, this takes a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice and discipline do we know that we'll be what we'll be doing or seeing in day seven to attain additional fruits uh other than the Jacob's Ladder ministry concept, when he saw the angels ascending and descending on the ladder, which is a word picture symbolism of the fact that there's ascending and descending uh, going on with ministering to those, which is also evidence from Matthew 25, 10 virgin parable, when he said, go to those who market and sell, referring to those in the heavenlies who had not taken the extra measure of oil, they slighted it, and now they have to go to earth where time slows down for them they can catch up the additional what they need to come back up and a few do qualify for that so that imagery of the Jacob's ladder the exchange in Matthew 25 of the going to the market and sell kind of alludes to the fact that the fruit yield is in reference to our interactions just like it is now our interactions with our God and with our fellow man it's always related to that it's always our interactions with God through applying his word and then with our inner, inner relationship with him and then also from that how do we then apply that to our fellow man around us and helping them to likewise see God and his word and the truth and with love, right? So that, that, that's what that's about. So how that means, what, what the specific nature of that is, that's a good question, I do not know. The unjust steward has a very clear uh, job, for example. He was, stewardship was taken from him in Luke 16, another passage that people in church and they go, I don't know what that means. Make your friends with deceitful wealth. <laughs> what the heck does that mean, right? So they don't understand the passage at all. But he's talking about a guy who's he's basically, he's, 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 he's give, give me your ledger. And they had miscounted, they had miscalculated, they were presumptuous. And he goes, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something. I did the same thing and I'm telling you, I wasted my stewardship. I know all too well where this is heading for you. You don't, you don't have 100, you, you have 80. I, I suggest you get to working because tick tock, he's coming. What? No, we're done. No, you ain't done. You're a presumpt you're a presumptive you're a presumptive, lazy, arrogant, prideful, not humbled person. And I'm telling you, been there, done that, got a t-shirt, and I can't change my status. I'm trying to help you. Trust me, you need to, you're short 20. You need to go make it up. Oh, and you too, with the oil. You're, you're short cores of wheat, you're short your baths of oil. You better get your life right. I'm telling you, stop assuming things and stop posturing. You think you've already got it all done. You're not done, but you're not done. And that's what he's basically educating them on. You're never done. The work's never done. And by the way, I always make this comment that if Jesus is 
which he is, ruling as king on the earth, and he's ruling with the rod of iron. He's actually, you know, governing over all of humanity. And by the way, we know there's sin involved. But no, there's not. Yeah, there is, because at the end of Revelation, chapter 20, verse 9, a thousand year period comes to an end, that the sand of the sea come against the camp of the saints. Where did they come from? Which means there were sinners on the earth. There was sin not at the end. So then if they, to that many, by the way, sand of the sea means bu 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 billions, which means that he's governing over people that are still in sinful behaviors. Who are those people? The survivors of the Jewish remnant and other people that survived tribulation and by the sin and death. And they also procreated. So those sinful people still create a need for governance of Jesus. So he's working it. So since when does he still work and you stop working? <laughs> no, 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 no. Jesus said in John 13, uh, no servant is greater than his master. If he's working, you can trust me on this. You're working, Jack. You're you working. There's no way he's going to work going, you can take a seat, Lee. I'm going to press you to relax. I got, I got this. If he's working, I'm working. Because I'm, I, why would I? I would? No, 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 no. The reason he's working right now as a high priest interceding for us is why? Because he calls for me and you to be working out our salvation. He says, you better be working. Occupy till I come. That's why he's there work. He's there, he's there on our behalf to catch us where we fall, restore us, and reset us, refresh us. He's there to help us. As we're, he's working to do what? Help us along while we are working, right? The day of rest out ahead for him is when he finally gets his glory at the great white throne. Then he ascends to that heavenly throne of his own, takes his bride. And then he stops working and everybody stops working. And he's like, it's all done now. Now it's all time for Thanksgiving. And then after that thousand year Thanksgiving of those who have been a part of the blessing of the Holy City and those on the outside looking in at our darkness, he goes, okay, now that short brief time of clemency for those who fell short, who got a glimpse, that comes to an end. And now we're at the time of all the sin cloth for all things been fulfilled and he just takes off and leaves and they're all like, no, well, too bad. So that, that, that's the way it is. And, and only those in the city get to stay there forever. And everybody else has this perfect, awesome, beautiful earth. But the reality is, uh, you go back to page 8, there's typology of the bride and the bridegroom is in Scripture. So you have Eve was taken out of man, which is a symbolism of an out-resurrection from a solical body and invaded by the Spirit to be his glorious bride. She was the bride of the man. And she was taken out of, it was his body of sin and death? No. His body was a solical body. He was not sin and death. Interesting. See, people don't talk about that. You know, the chitwitism, oh, take out of the man, so, you know, she's out of, yeah, but what kind of body did he have? Sinless body. Mm. Oh, which speaks to an out-resurrection of a, somebody who already has a resurrected body. Holy Toledo. And we already know that based on Luke, what's Luke? Luke, Luke chapter 20, not everybody in Christ gets to be having a watch. Watch, go to Luke chapter 20. Watch this. We saw this verse before in Luke chapter 20. We've seen it before. So let's read it and, and ask a different question this time. In Luke chapter 20 and verse 35. But those deemed worthy to obtain that age. What do you mean obtain? Well, I don't understand. Why do I have to be, if it's a guaranteed thing, why are you phrasing it like this, Jesus? To be obtained worthy. To obtain the age. What age is that? What do you think it is, dude? His age, right? The Messianic age. To obtain it and that resurrection from the dead, neither marry or given in marriage, for they can die no more. Now, wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. Think about it. <laughs> okay, think about it. So, if you're raised from the dead, isn't it already assumed that you've been dead? Right? So, why would he say die no more? What? There, wait a second. So you're telling me some folks are raised and they could die again? Why would you say they obtain, where do you obtain a resurrection? And those who do that will not die again. The inference is those who don't obtain a resurrection can die twice. Oh, wait a second, Jesus. You did call it like a fire. What'd you call it again? A second death. What? Oh, uh, hello, right? I didn't write that. Why did he say that? Why did he say they, will not, they won't die anymore? Well, duh, if they've been dead, and they rose again from the dead, why would you have to say that? Why? Because he's referencing those who aren't a part of the resurrection, who didn't be accounted worthy to obtain. They do get raised, not a part of the resurrection, and they can and will die again if they don't have their fruit yields and they don't have their life lived right. 
you know, the type of that like Lazarus and Jairus' daughter and the rest of the people that were raised in the Old Testament, you know. Elijah and the widow's son, did they get risen up from the dead? Yeah. Did they live all, evermore? No, they died. They died twice. Uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> so God's not the first time he's doing this. Physically, he showed you people that lived and died twice. Physically. There are folks that died twice in the Bible. So therefore, you can die twice spiritually too because he said it right here. He said in Luke 20, 35, about obtaining and being found worthy to be a part of the resurrection. But in verse 36, you can die no more because you are like angels. This is where we look at the idea, you become an angel. Oh, God took my loved one because he needed an angel in heaven. Oh, my gosh. That's not what he said. He didn't say you are an angel. You're like an angel, meaning a celestial body. Don't be, don't be, come on. You're, you're embellishing it. He said being sons of the resurrection. It's too much your body. Because you go from, if you are able to obtain and be found worthy of the resurrection, then you have a minimum solical body, which has no blood in it. Right? So it's flesh and bone. But then when you get to a spiritual body, you're, you're flesh and no bone, but you have a body. You glorify bodies after that. So you have the, rede you have the sinful body, redeemed body, solical body, spiritual body, glorified body. We talked about this on last conference. It's on your paper from last conference. But the reality is that you, this is interesting when he said they'll die no more. I think it's that verse 36. I was so focused on verse 35. I think as you probably were too. But wow, being found worthy to obtain the resurrection. That you don't bother to ask that second question of verse 36. And will die no more. Why are you saying that? Isn't that assumed? If I was dead and I was worthy to obtain the resurrection, then like you just brought him back to life. Why would you have to say, I die no more? If you just raised me up, why would I even be in fear of that? No matter a spiritual event, right? So I don't understand why you even, because the inverse is true, who, who are not found worthy to obtain, they'll be raised, they'll fall short of resurrection, and they'll have an unfortunate reality of dying again. Oof. Not just physically, but spiritually, as in Lake of Fire, as in, and by the way, those who go to Lake of Fire, I love how it always talks about them uh, in, in and actually in, in the verse where he doesn't he doesn't go into this whole he doesn't go into all this those who don't believe in Jesus he goes into cowards and, and adulterers and why are you naming like sins itself why you don't want it if it's lake of fires for people that don't, don't believe in Jesus why don't you just say that why don't you say for those who don't believe in Jesus but no God lists these litany of things and people in per church yeah, just gloss right over it <laughs> I ask the question why 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 does he say that like that because he's talking about people in Christ who live on becoming. That's why he says in Matthew, he gathers out of his kingdom workers of iniquity. You see, it's also where it's key to understand. Is it in your heart? We already proved that's not true from yesterday's study. So if it's not in your heart, it's physical kingdom, then uh-oh, when Jesus in Matthew 13 talked about gathering workers of iniquity out of his kingdom, well, that's scary. Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. How did, what? His kingdom is not heaven. It's his kingdom on this messianic reign. He's going to gather folks out of it who are doing iniquitous things. And when you go to Matthew 13, he tells you about that. You go to Matthew 13, watch what he does to him. It's not a good ending. It's not pretty. And I'm going to go back to that verse in just a minute, Lane. I'll, I'll answer that question. But you go to, in, in chapter uh, 13 of Matthew, and you go to verse 40, in 41, as therefore the Darnells gathered and burned into fire, so will it be at the end of the age, when the Son of Man will then send forth his messengers and gather out of his kingdom all the seducers and iniquitous persons. That means those who are causing stumbling blocks, and the word seducers is anomious people, those who are against the law, which is the word for rebellious people or transgressors, it should say. Um, and what happens to them? Jesus, verse 42 of Matthew 13, I'm going to throw them into a furnace of fire what? And there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That does not sound pleasant to me. So for those who, well, that's just, he means out of this, uh, they're not in heaven, right? They're not in, the kingdom is not in their heart now, and he's going to gather out of his kingdom. What? You're making no sense. If they don't believe in Jesus, how are they in his kingdom? So explain it to me. Think what you're saying. If the kingdom is physical, which it is, it makes sense. It's because of the messianic reign. If the kingdom is spiritual, it's in your heart, then you're only part of that kingdom if you believe in Jesus. 
But preachers tell me that Matthew 13 refers to those who are, aren't a part of living in Jesus. They're the workers of iniquity. But how does it mean out of his kingdom, then? You, you, they have no answer. It doesn't make any sense, and they know it. They're caught. With, in a, well, it's a parable. You have to understand. You're reading into it. That's where they're going to go. That's where they go to. It's unbelievable. Go back to Luke for a minute now when Planey asked me about verse 38 in chapter 20. In chapter 20 in verse 38, he says, um, and he said, uh, but he said, now he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. And so he's talking about the fact that those who die physically are not dead spiritually, that believe in him. So the idea is, the reference is not to all human beings, it's to those who already trust in him, back to verse 37, but that the dead rise. Even Moses has declared after the bush, after the bush he calls Jehovah or Shaveh, and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So he's not a God of the dead, but the living, for to him all are alive. So he's referring to those who trust in Christ, never die. Which is what Jesus said in John 11 to Mary about Lazarus. Do you know he believes in me that you'll never die? Well, that makes no sense. We all die. He means spiritually. You're never going to die. Which is where you get the idea from. That's why people ask me, why are folks in Christ who do go to the lake of fire hey, 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 and want to stay there forever? Because they can't, they can't. Because that's a death they're experiencing. Thanatos' death is Gehenna, which is in part of the lake of fire. The lake of fire itself is second death. They can't, they, 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 they can never stay in that state of death. They can't. Because Jesus said so. He said, he believes in me, shall never die. They won't die. The word dies in an ongoing tense. They won't stay in that state. You just won't. That's what he's saying. Doesn't mean you won't experience it, because obviously we do. We'll never die. I experience a death now, but it's temporary. I'm brought back to life, just like you are. And so that's what he's talking about here, that there's a temporal physical death, there's a temporal spiritual death, but no one stays, who is in Christ, stays dead physically or stays dead spiritually. They will experience it potentially, Right? Death, we all experience physically. But spiritual, we may, all, we may or may not experience that. But either way, none of us in Christ stay that way. Never, none of us. We're all going to come back to life. He says that to raise you up on the last day. So, with that being said, you go back to um, Old Testament also, um, back to page 8. Rebecca was chosen from among Abraham's kindred. She gave to, Elie to Eliezer, her, her, his servants, and their camels also, three measures of blessings. So she speaks to three measures of blessings. Not just being called, but not just being not just being called, not just being chosen, but being called out. And, and she shows a uniqueness in that and how she became, from that, she became later on the bride to Isaac, right? How interesting is that? I don't find it interesting. I find it just coincidence she had three blessings of giving Eleazar his servants and the camels three measures of blessings she was called, chosen, and called out. You know, or you could say in a different order. Though. She was chosen, called, and then called out, meaning the second tier of calling, right? So she had all of that. She, she had this idea, and then later on, I'm looking at, we're on page eight of the, of, the, um, of the paper, and we're looking at the typology of the bride, the bridegroom in scripture, Old Testament, under the Rebecca, and it's referencing Genesis 24, 1 to 66. I'm just paraphrasing the story. I'm not actually reading the actual verse. Before the verse I was talking about was in Luke 20, verse 35 and 36, and then Laney wanted to expound on verse 38. That was from Luke 20 earlier. So then you go to Joseph as a type of Christ's messianic rule when he took a Gentile bride. Interesting. So the bride of Christ is a, uh, then a Jewish man is a Gentile bride when he was in a position of authority over the kingdom of Egypt. That's in Genesis 41. Interesting. And other people say, well, um, well, the bride of Christ is, is Israel. No, no, no. Because why would you think a Gentile bride is a type of Jesus having this rulership over the kingdom? That's interesting to me. Because he is a definite type of Christ. Then Moses' type of Christ is a prophet leading the people to the inheritance of the promised land. He also took a Gentile bride after he willingly left his kingdom behind just like Jesus did, willingly left his kingdom behind. The Philippians 2, he took a Gentile bride, humbled himself just like Jesus did, became a shepherd just like Jesus did, in a foreign land just like Jesus did. Shut your mouth. It's unbelievable. 
the, the symmetry is unbelievable, right? There's this bridegroom and bride situation going on. We see that with Moses. Then with Ruth, she shows us, she alone aligned herself with truth among her other sister-in-laws as the only one to continue on in faith, striving. And then later, so, so first she's the only one who continues on in faith. And then she later, after this separate of separation of time, she later on, continuing to do this, we find her at the feet of Boaz at the threshing floor where she was vetted and accepted as his Gentile bride. I mean, come on. They were all Naomi's sister-in-laws. She's the only one to continue to strive. And then from that time of striving, she then found herself later on from the gleanings to then at Boaz's feet. He, she's then vetted and accepted as because uh, he, he wanted to make sure the kids and redeemer thing was in play. And she's accepted as a Gentile bride. Come on. These are just all these different things. Uh, well, everybody in Christ is the same. We're all the bride. How do you explain these things? I'm pointing out to you. They're so obvious. Whether you see typology or not, whether you see that it's true or not, come on. You cannot disagree with everything I just said here, what I'm writing to you here, about what Scripture is talking about. I'm just gleaning facts and asking questions. How does this speak to everybody being the same? It just doesn't. Look at the New Testament. Twelve disciples in Matthew 12, all names compared to the seven disciples and that uh, Jesus called in Luke 10. Unknown names. And of the twelve disciples, Jesus called out Peter, James, and John frequently. And of these, it was only John who was named the one Jesus loved and charged him to care for Mary at the cross. Another, this, this, this degrees of separation. 70 verses 12. Of the 12, there was three. Of the three, there was one. But you're going to tell me we're all the same to Jesus. Then explain yourself to me. I'm just, well, I was Old Testament before. I didn't understand. How about the New Testament? I'm just gleaning facts and trying to ask the questions. If you don't understand what, who the bride of Christ is and why we're saying and why scripture, scripture is talking about her differently, understand what God did in the Old Testament is the same he did in the New Testament. He continued to parse out groups amongst his people. See it. Understand it. Go Apostle John. The only apostle that wasn't murdered. Only one at the cross. First one in the empty tomb. The only one to see revelation of all things to come. Explain that to me. If we're all the same, we're all treated the same. I don't know why you see it and I don't see it. Peter, by the way, we saw earlier the other day, 2 Peter chapter 3, 15, 16, 17, he said, uh, Paul's writings are off the chain. Paraphrase. And uh, if, that's, if you're not grounded in your faith, or if you're not learned, you're going to misinterpret them to your own destruction. And by the way, that would be like, don't you know, I always put this analogy out there, but imagine, um, say in the room is Mozart and Beethoven and Bach and Brahm and all these heavy hitters of classical music. And I start right now on the board, you know, musical arrangements, and I start doing the, the and I start doing this stuff, and da, 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 da. And also, I drop the pen, and I leave the room, and they go, and, and they all say, no clue, what does that even mean? Dude, that makes me uh, a savant, okay? If I'm, if I'm confounding Mozart, and Beethoven, and Brahm, and Bach, and all these guys, who are the fathers of classical music? That's saying something. So Peter, I'm saying it to you, is not a stupid idiot moron. He's a very brilliant man and wisdom of spirit that God gave to him. And he is telling you that Paul's writing is not something you just, oh, I just read it and it applies to me because it's all about me and then my teacher says, oh. Peter's saying, no, 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 no. I'm telling you, I don't understand what he's saying. I'm, I, he's no, he's the best of the best of us. And he's saying, Paul's writing to over my head. And yet we haphazardly approach Ephesians. He's talking to me, man. You just chill with that. Start understanding that the principle of Paul's writings, which is 45% of the New Testament, is written at a high level. And so you, if you don't understand that, first of all, how are you not going to misinterpret, misapply, misunderstand? How can, how can you not? You're going to. Not even realizing it. So I'm just pointing out to you that John, the Apostle John is the only one who was given this revelation of the end things to come. Even Apostle Paul, who saw the, the third heaven, but in his case, he said... I can't even write about it. John has shown the third heaven and things to come. He's like, and I was told to write about it. Oh, but there's one time in Revelation 10, remember, when the seven thunderings, he goes, he starts to write down, and God goes, you can't write that. Well, that was weird. Okay, I thought you said, write down everything I see and hear, and next thing you know, he's told, but, but not that. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but John was writing about it. But Paul sees it and goes, I can't even put words to it. Which allows you to understand that when John was putting the Revelation book into, into words, 
It was obviously God's words he gave to him. John of his own accord did not go, that's like an angel. It looks like a trumpet. No, he was told what to write. He did not go, wow, it looks like a fire. It looks like a bull. That looks like, it looks like demons. No. He was told, that's what that is, that's what that is. What you're seeing is this. What you're hearing is that. He was told what to write. Because how do I prove that? Because Paul said, I can't even put to words what I'm seeing. Then how did John? Think about that. Because he was told. So why wasn't Paul told? He was the wisest of all of them, Peter said. He wasn't told. But John was told that only with like about two years left on his life, maybe two to five years left on his life, he's told. At the very, very end, he's told this wonderful thing. And all of them are already dead. He's the last one alive. And he's like, oh, now you're telling me? <laughs> he's about to die. And now you know. I'm just, you can't just ignore stuff like that. So anyway, John the Baptist is on page nine. He's the one who prepared the way for Jesus. Jesus said he was the greatest of all born of women before or after him, which is in Matthew 11, 11. We just talked about that. John also was caused for his mother and father to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Those are the references I mentioned earlier. He alone referred to Jesus as the bridegroom. I mentioned that to you. The Apostle Paul is unique as the only apostle to not have walked with Jesus during his ministry, but had three years of private tutoring by Christ near the holy ground where the Lord, Lord God appeared to Moses. Peter remarks that Paul's teachings and understandings are far surpassed all the apostles. You can find those references to the teaching in the backside of the desert, Galatians 1, 15, 18. Peter's statement about Paul, writings being complex, 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Paul referred to what he taught as the full counsel of God, which is which he in like kind imparted to those he taught. So I want to go back to that. We, we didn't go to that yesterday. Go back to Acts in chapter 20. The Acts in chapter 20. So when you go to Acts chapter 20, so you go with this Acts in, in chapter 20, and verse 26 and 27, before it gets into the part about the rapacious or burdensome wolves, he said in verse Acts chapter 20, 25 and 26, and now behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone proclaiming the kingdom of the God, will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am pure from the blood of all, for I have kept not back from announcing to you the love of God in Jesus Christ dying for your sins. That's not what he said. He said, I kept not announcing from you the will of God to you. The word there, the balumai, the will of God. I declare that uh, all the will of God, God's balumai, his, his, his internal, his counsel, his, his, his intentions. God, he didn't just talk about Jesus' love. He calls it, in some translations, it says counsel, which is a good translation. It comes from God's internal motive, his intentions, not just what God's love is. That's not what he said. Why would he say that? Why would he have to say, I withheld not back from you, as if to say, I'm pure from your blood, as if to say it was an obligation? Because it was an obligation of his. God, Jesus, gave him a depth of understanding, and he was obligated to teach other people that, that information and to help them understand. Being saved in Christ is wonderful. What you do with it is a pretty big deal. You're accountable, guys. I want you to understand this. I want you to understand fully God's intent as to why he set you apart, why he decreed you before time to be his son, his daughter, his child, his servant. Let me help you understand this. What's at stake? What do you answer to? And he made sure about that. So that's why he said at the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself, but you see you be in the faith. You better check yourself. I'm not saying you're saved or not saved. He's not saying that. He's saying check yourself and vet yourself are you thinking, are you doing, are you living, are you striving, are you prioritizing what is right? With who's in mind, who you answer to, what's, what's at stake? And so that's what Paul's talking about. He says it's full counsel of God. Then you get to also look into Romans 2.16. Look into Romans 2.16 as well. Look in Romans 2.16. He has another statement that Paul writes. Romans 2.16. He says, in a in Romans 2.16, on the day according to my glad tidings, God will judge the hidden things of men through Christ Jesus.